Hello and welcome to the Launchpad. This is a variation of the Startup Storefront podcast where we talk to the founders of companies that are just getting started and whose stories we find compelling. Today we talk with Haley Russell, founder of the dog food company Chippin. If you've ever bought dog food, chances are the ingredients include something like beef or chicken. Fine for your dog to eat, but when you scale the production, those food groups become entirely unsustainable. On the other side of the equation is the invasive species known as silver carp. This fish has been slowly making its way north up the Mississippi River toward the Great Lakes. To put it lightly, it would be a massive problem if silver carp make it into Lake Michigan. Haley was able to kill two birds with one stone by substituting silver carp in the place of beef or chicken in her dog food. Our furry friends will still get all the nutrients they need in a much more sustainable fashion. So listen in as we cover everything from running a cricket farm, tapping into the dogecoin craze, and why the standards for pet food and baby food are similar. Now, on to the episode. All right, welcome to the podcast, everyone. On today's show, we're talking to Haley, the founder of Chippin. Thanks so much for joining. Please tell everyone a little bit about what Chippin is. Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me. So Chippin is a pet food company that we created to deliver on the demand for foods that are great for our pets and great for the planet. And so right now we have a a suite of dog food products that are powered by planet-friendly proteins like crickets, overpopulated silver carp, and spirulina. Okay, so what year did you start the company? I started working on it full-time in 2019, um, but of course, in advance of that, there was a whole lot of learning. Sure, and so what made you passionate about this space? What were you doing before? Obviously, I, we know you have a pet, we know you have a dog, but what are the, some of the things that made you passionate about the space and recognize an opportunity for starting something and, and launching a brand? I have always been a big time foodie. I grew up in the DC area. I was born in Berkeley. The interest in talking about food at the dinner table was kind of lifelong for me. I grew up with a menu from Alice Waters signed um, in the kitchen. And I think, you know, just even as I was looking at my career trajectory starting off, I, I worked in finance. Then I worked with a handful of different food and beverage companies within the human food space. So a juice company, uh, spent time with an NGO working in coffee. And so I've always kind of been dabbling within food, whether it be uh, from a personal or a professional perspective. And so in 2016, I became super intrigued by the potential to innovate within the protein space. And we've seen plant-based just boom for people. And when I started to look at my personal pet food experience, I couldn't find something that was high quality, really tasty and sustainable. Same kind of beef and chicken kibbles when it comes to pets. Um, I thought, why isn't there something new? Like, why can't we find a consumer product within the pet food space that delivers on on my values and what I'm seeing has been innovated upon within every other consumer category. I'm just curious in this. So I was born in Peru and in Peru, the dogs eat exactly what the humans eat. It's like potatoes or beans or rice. Like that's what the dog gets. And so when I moved to this country, I was like, what is, what is happening to these dogs? And then I would ask people that own pets, I would say, why don't you just give your dog what you eat? And they would say, oh no, that gives the dog cancer. Or like, they were very quick to tell me that it gets the dog sick. And I was thinking to myself, how is it that there's a whole country of not sick dogs that are thriving? And then I think about the space today and it's exactly what's happening. It's like the dogs are eating exact, like people are now cooking for their dog. Or We're in West Hollywood on Santa Monica Boulevard. There's really a store probably two blocks away and they literally cook food every day whether it's peas or potatoes or some mix. And I'm just like, what illusion have Americans been under? I didn't understand this. And and I still don't know, by the way, I still don't know if that's accurate, but at least that's always been my, it was always strange to me, right? I think there are two things that, that drive a, a really different market here within the US. One is there are regulations when it comes to pet food diets. And so when we create a diet for our dogs, we just came out with an oven baked um, food that's powered by silver carp and overpopulated fish, wild caught, um, we source it directly uh, out in Kentucky. And so when we create that, we actually have to meet a bunch of 
guidelines for a complete and balanced meal. And so I think with that and um, people relying upon the advice from their veterinarians, they're kind of, they've, there's been a lot of looking to in the past decades, really kind of big pet food companies. And then now we're seeing all this innovation and how do we, how do we create kind of better for our dog products while still kind of meeting these guidelines. And then the second thing is a lot of people here aren't even cooking for themselves. So the notion that they would cook for their, for their dog when they're not making their own food, it, you know, that's a, probably a little bit of a stretch for a lot of people. Are the standards higher for dogs or are they about this <laughs> when it comes to dog I, versus human What does that say about us? Yeah, <laughs> it's actually people do their diligence on pet products way more than they do for their own foods. And so I, I would say that when you're looking at a pet food company or the pet food industry, it's very similar to baby food because it's, you know, it's your fur baby. You want to make sure you're getting the best for him or her. So what was your first step in starting the company? What was the very first prototype or like, how did you start testing? How did you start launching into the going down the rabbit hole? Of figuring this out? First step was talking to veterinarians. So I talked to a head of nutrition at the University of Pennsylvania and learned everything I could. And then I started talking to PhDs, animal uh, scientists about, uh, nutrition scientists about um, these proteins that I believed to be superfoods for dogs to start and was able to get the science backed <laughs> information that we needed. Uh, and then I moved into just in my home kitchen, I mocked up our very first treat. It's a, it called our superfood treat. It's a peanut butter, cricket and pumpkin uh, oven baked crunchy treat. I started with that and did it myself and then worked to find a co-manufacturing relationship in which they could um, execute upon what I designed and then had reviewed by a board certified veterinarian. How did you get into crickets? This is the, you mentioned <laughs> yeah. crickets. You mentioned the oversupply of cod. I yeah. like the fact that you're going over, over, you know, the oversupply of certain things, but how did that get on your radar? <laughs> well, the, when we look at Chippen as a company, what we do is we, we really look to strategically source these proteins that are more digestible than chicken. They're complete sources of protein, more ethically crafted and use 80% plus less resources. Uh, started with crickets actually before working on chipping, I, I mentioned that I was doing a deep dive in, in protein and I, I created a small cricket farm. <laughs> so I was going to, I was going to business school. I got some grants and I had a, a small cricket farm in which I learned everything about the supply chain. And that kind of set me on the path for being able to stand by that as our first protein source. Like you had a cricket farm, but you were then harvesting it. Were you ever consuming it yourself? Because I know from my own knowledge about crickets is that certain countries around the world, it's very normal for them to eat insects because they're very high in protein. They're uh, abundantly present. And I know for the at least the, the Western markets, it's not been a thing at all because of the aversion to eating an insect. I mean, did you ever experiment in ter in terms of using crickets as a dietary source for yourself? You're absolutely right. More than 2 billion people globally eat insects. Um, there are thousands of species that are really nutrient dense and tasty. And the initial thinking I had was, oh, this, this could be a protein source for people. But then as I started to explore it more and more, just saw really the challenges in moving from trial. So testing out a cricket protein bar that's kind of novel and maybe something to talk about or is part of a dare to actual adoption where you know you're craving that ingredient and you psychologically feel safe and comfortable with it and so it ended up kind of happening it was by happenstance that my family golden doodle wren wagging her tail expressing interest and i'd had this kind of lifelong almost tension of my family generally plant-based. Um, my mom was a really early vegetarian. Um, then we'd go and feed the dog and it always seemed a little weird. And so I ended up having this kind of eureka moment of golden doodle wren wanted to eat a cricket. And I was like, oh, whoa, what, maybe this could kind of solve what I'd seen as um, something kind of odd within my, my own household. And then when I found out that USA Pets, if you consider them their own country, they rank fifth in global meat consumption 
that was kind of the moment where I saw this was a massive market opportunity and issue. What was your first step from there? And so did, were, you, were you working on packaging, branding? Was it raising capital? What was the, like the very first thing you did before you launched? So we did a very, very scrappy version of this in 2019, which was funded by a couple of grants and really just kind of a lot of hustle and muscle. And so we got out our first two versions of a crunchy treat in 2019, raised a tiny bit of angel capital and then got in, got in a few stores, started to see that dogs truly loved it, that pet parents didn't have that kind of aversion or, or challenge like they do in eating it themselves. And there had been education through other companies on this is a truly powerful source of protein. And so 2019, really, really scrappy. And then in 2020, raised some capital to create new flavors. We introduced a vegan dog treat, our spirulina dailies treat, and it grew and, and got some more distribution. And so how many different products do you have right now? Now we have four different crunchy treats. Um, we have a daily food made from wild caught silver carp. And we just came out at the end of 2021 with two jerkies. All right. So here you are. You, you got three different products. It sounds like you're past your seed round, let's call it. And so what do you view as, you know, what is the thing on the roadmap for you? Is it more, more stores, a distribution? Is it D to C? What are some of the things that you're just like laser focused on right now for 2022, 2023? 2022 is going to be a big year for us in terms of store growth. When we started to get into retail, it was 2020 and we kind of got a handful of pet specialty shops in and then COVID hit. And um, that was a really tough time for those retailers. So we actually pulled back from the initial wholesale distribution plan that we had for 2020. And then in 2021, we ended up, uh, we partnered with Grove Collaborative. So we did some really kind of cool e-com marketplaces. Um, we got into Petco, um, but as we're looking at 2022, we've now started selling chip in and air one. And I think there's a ton of room for growth for us within the specialty grocery channel. And then some of these kind of specialty shops where, um, you find cool beverages or little gifts, um, chip in plays really well in those channel, those stores too. When you first started out, you know, it's, it's, you have this idea. What was the first moment that you brought someone else onto your team and, and, who or what was that hire? I first brought on a designer and kind of branding marketing expert um, so that we'd be able to build out not only a product, but really set ourselves up to create chipping into more of a movement. And so even when you look at the name, chip in gets that kind of how can we all participate and do something that's really awesome for our dogs and the planet. Did you try and design and, and market it yourself first, or did you recognize right away that this wasn't your, your forte? I have a background in uh, my first job was in finance, and then I did a, a lot of work in supply chain and operations. And I'm someone who likes learning about CPG companies, but I've never designed packaging or anything like that. So I knew that um, that was something where we need to bring on uh, someone to help. I like the fact that you're an Erwan. To me, that makes sense. Like, I just think about from a strategy perspective, you want to be where people are. Like you said, if you're not cooking for yourself, you're probably like not going to cook for your dog. And so the fact of meeting people where they are, Erwan, Whole Foods, some of these stores, there's an alignment there and there's a natural appreciation for betterness, for wellness. And so I think there's, it seems like a no brainer. At the same time, I think being in a place like Petco, I, I go the opposite, right? Where it's like, they're just looking for the kibbles and bits, the super dry food, and they probably don't care what Fluffy likes in my head, obviously, like when I think about Petco, I think about toys, buying, you know, all, all like the things that are fun for the dog, not so much food related, unless I'm buying a 40 pound bag of food. But that also makes it challenging to scale. Right, exactly. So we, we did the Petco partnership as part of an eco initiative that they launched in 2021. And so we were one of nine anchor brands in which they released this much broader commitment to bringing in sustainable products. Um, and so it was sort of a, a shorter term feature in which we were working with them to help set a program for introducing sustainability into the pet food space. But totally agree, you're exactly right. Like we, as a small company, think a lot about how do we ensure that we're getting distribution and eyes um, really in front of the people that 
are ready for cricket protein or wild silver carp ba uh, based dog food. At the end of the Petco feature, what takeaways did you have from that? It was a great learning experience for um, working with a really big retailer. The timelines, of course, for kind of creating in-store displays or um, kind of setting up marketing promotions were way longer than I realized. I'm, I'm sure that's um, me just kind of being new to the industry. But I think also just you know, kind of really looking at how how can we as a as a brand that also has a pretty strong Instagram presence and does a good job of of driving D to C sales, um, also add value to these bigger companies was you know kind of interesting to explore for us. So when it comes to like what markets hit for you, L A has got to obviously it's a slam dunk. Um, is it the same in terms of like just major city, Chicago, New York? Uh, is that does it follow suit? We see really interesting pockets of consumers throughout the country. Boise, Idaho is a city in which um, there's a lot of interest in, in chipping, Bozeman, Montana. Um, so I think wherever you have a group of folks who are interested in sustainability or um, kind of maybe living more of a natural lifestyle, um, there tends to be a chipping interest. And then one of the things that's really cool about our silver carp protein is it's it's an invasive species. And so anybody who grows up in the Midwest, like if you're growing up in Wisconsin, you live in Milwaukee, you as a high schooler are learning about this problem and how it's a, a threat to the Great Lakes and that we need to save the $7 billion Great Lakes fishing economy. And so there's been a lot of education in states around the Great Lakes. And so we see a ton of interest there. You know, it's interesting, uh, the, the silver carp phenomenon is something that I didn't grow up in the Midwest, but I have become aware of in the past few years. And there have been all sorts of proposals in how to deal with the problem. Uh, and they range from from everything to like, let's create dams in the rivers and, and streams up to Lake Michigan so that they don't go any further. There have also been proposals to electrocute the the rivers and and it'll kill the, the silver carp and probably everything else, but at the cost of saving Lake Michigan. I'm curious about, by integrating the silver carp into your dog food, have you seen an increase in terms of the number of commercial fishermen or just r people who are able to, like you said, they're wild caught. Have you seen an increase in the interest in people trying to at least um, fish these things out of the river? We're seeing some. We're, we're a small company, and so we're really trying to get the word out too. Um, but I think the, the point that you make around there are so many resources being directed toward this problem, but most of them are just trying to kind of stop the movement of the fish from the Mississippi River kind of surrounding waterways into the Great Lakes. And we're really one of very few companies, um, and especially, you know, kind of one of the only uh, that's operating kind of more at scale that's including it in a food product domestically. And so we're kind of creating a market around it. And we know, and I know from talking to the U.S. Department of Fish and, and Wildlife out in Kentucky and a couple other states, that the most effective way to control for it is to actually fish for this fish. It's a fish we need to fish when so many others are overfished. Do you think that maybe other companies will jump on board or like with, the, um, unlike the crickets, do you think that, that human consumption of silver carp will will rise as well i hope please spread the word <laughs> I, I i have been sending samples to some chefs because it's really a very mild like flaky nice white fish um just nobody knows about it and so one of the things that our team did was we got some silver carp, had it all sent out, and we did a Zoom session where I created a recipe for us to all make silver carp dumplings, and they were so tasty. <laughs> when I think about your business, there's a lot of, it's it's almost like um, it's straightforward, but it's also difficult, right? And so it's like, I think about, okay, how would I grow her business? Okay, one, I'd probably have to do all these tastings all the time at Irwan, other places, dog parks. I'd have to hit the ground running, hit the pavement, hire a whole team to be able to do that. Two... There's this like the sustainability, eco-friendly portion that 
you could spend a lot of time in it and get no value, right? In the sense of like, how much time do I want to spend in Kentucky versus in Irwan or, right? And so it's like yield, but you have to do all of it and some of it. And so it's a function of like, where do you get the most yield? And so, and, and you're in that like, before you get to that next step, right? You're in that, that, that challenging part where it's just pounding the pavement. You're absolutely right. And uh, we just we just brought on a field marketer. And so we've really been leaning into that on the ground effort. And it's been interesting for also um, kind of seeing how that translates to the digital experience and education and telling both the nutrition and the sustainability story to people directly. Yeah, it's a tough one for sure. When I think about it, it's like dog parks. Do you guys go to dog parks? You know, I know there's, there's a lot of like subscription based dog parks now popping up around the country, mostly because, because within COVID everyone adopted a new pet of some kind. And so it seems like the market is, is growing. Um, and with that, obviously education also goes, but where do you guys place most, most of your energy in terms of sort of like when you talk to your field marketer now, what's the, what does it look like? What's on the agenda? Yeah, um, we've definitely been doing doing some dog parks. Apartment buildings have been great too because you have a really easy way to target a certain set of consumers. And then shelters are awesome um, because whenever you can get someone at the point in which they're bringing a dog into their home is a kind of critical point where they're making that food decision. And so we do quite a, a few events at shelters where there's an adoption event and people are kind of coming home with their dog and we sample the product and they can even buy that on site. I wanted to ask you something. So here, our coffee shop, we have a coffee shop in front of our studio, which is kind of fun. And every dog that shows up gets a free treat. To me, I hadn't actually thought about this until I'm talking to you, but it's almost like coffee shops become an opportunity also. Uh, not because they're literally selling it, but it's like, hey, does your dog want a treat? Here, here you go. And then, oh, what's what's in it? People always ask, at least here. The, obviously, we're in West Hollywood, so a lot more consciousness around food. But it's like the free samples ask. of Costco. Yeah, 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 exactly. One of the things we're, we're, talk, we're asking all the founders this year is around crypto, the NFT space. Maybe a little early for you in terms of your business, but are you thinking about that at all? Are you thinking about how do you, yeah, go ahead. How do you view that for Chippin? It is a little early for us. I was interested in crypto pretty early. I had been working at a bank out in LA. And so it's always been on my radar. We did, this is not quite what you're asking, but with Dogecoin, we did a couple of kind of fun campaigns. Um, So we did like a little to the moon special and coupled our treats with kind of this like really cool forever tin. And so we've kind of been playing a little bit more in in the meme space and just like hopping on some of the trends related to it um, more than anything. I think it's going to be the theme of 2022 for us is like asking people how they view the space for their business specifically. Because it's evolving everything. I mean, even even for yourself, like, you know, Dogecoin, this this random meme coin <laughs> that all of a sudden made its way into the the, the thought process of, of people that were never aware of crypto. But like, it's good that you were able to capitalize off of that. And then Shiba followed up right behind it. Did you ever think about doing anything with Shiba as Chip well? Chip a perfect coin name, to be honest. Yeah. I, I mean, Chip in. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Good idea. We haven't done the Shiba one, but I've been following it. There's also some interesting ties when you kind of zoom out and even look at blockchain technology within the food and the ag space. Tons of interesting work going on there and then also um, ties to, to sustainability and traceability. And so for us, there's kind of a much broader application as we look at our sourcing practice and offering within kind of our, our actual tangible food product. Well, listen, for people that are listening and interested in, in getting their pets some food, just tell everyone where they can find, like literally buy it, whether it's D to C or even in the grocery stores. And then, um, yeah, yeah, just share where they can find you. Check us out on chipandpet.com, D to C, uh, Air One, Grove Collaborative, or take a look at our store lo- locator on our website. We have a handful of other pet specialty and grocery stores there. Well, Haley, cool. thank thanks, you. Haley. Yeah, thanks for joining the podcast. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Great to talk to you. The Startup Storefront team consists of Diego Torres Palma, Natalia Capellini, Owen Capellini, Lexi Jameson, and me, Nick Conrad. Our music is composed by Double Touch. 
We release a new episode each week, so make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a thing. Our handle for all social media platforms is at Startup Storefront. We also film all of these episodes and put them up on our YouTube page because there's just some things that can't be experienced through audio alone. You can always go back and listen to any of our other episodes available wherever you get your podcasts and on our website, startupstorefront.com. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next time.